Hi everybody, my name is Gabriele Vezzani. I am by now at the end of the first year of my PhD and I'm going to talk to you about a project uh, on which I've worked with my supervisor Massimo Salgaro and our research group about uh, theory of mind in fiction and non-fiction reading. Also we're going to discuss, uh, uh, we're going to talk about measurements of theory of mind specific to uh, the domain of empirical literary studies. Now for those of you that may not know, theory of mind is the ability of an individual to make inferences about what others may be thinking or feeling and to predict what they may do in a given situation based on those inferences. What is important to remember is that the theory of mind is automatic so we don't have to consciously process or consciously activate it to see, for example, in this picture that uh, the woman here is lost. And so to know that she intend to go somewhere and cannot, and she's probably in a state of anxiety. These are all things that we automatically infer and uh, automatically decode from, in this case, this visual stimulus. Or, for example, even with inanimate object, if we see a, a house like this, we can see a face, we can see a surprised face, we can attribute a mental state to this inanimate object. Another important thing is that theory of mind is a scalar, so it can be measured and uh, it fluctuates that we have different uh, individuals with different levels of this ability and also different uh, uh, clinical populations. The concept of theory of mind, maybe some of you know, became famous, uh, gained popularity with the research of Baron Cohen uh, that talked about the theory of mind, studied theory of mind in autistic children. But enough with the psychology and uh, let's ask ourselves why is this concept um, useful? in the context of literary studies. It has been put forward, most notably by Lisa Sunshine, that uh, um, our, the reader's relationship, the reader's engagement with fiction relies heavily on this cognitive function that we use a lot, our theory of mind, when we try to make sense of the fictional world that uh, narrative presents us with. So, um, also it is important to, to know that the mental state of the characters and this uh, all the me mental life that uh, we decode in narratives by using our theory of mind is not an accidental byproduct. It's not something like the surprised face of the house that we've seen before. but. It's there because authors consciously work on this dimension. That is a defining characteristic of literary fiction. The exploration and the presentation of complex mental state is something that actually characterizes literary fiction. The product, let's say, of the author's work on complex mental state are uh, these embeddings. What is an embedding? Very simply, um, if I think about uh, what someone else may be thinking about what someone else may be thinking, I am embedding mental states. Now in our everyday life, uh, we don't encounter as much as of these embeddings and they are almost uh, ubiquitous in literature. They are everywhere. Liter literary fiction could not function without this mental state complexity. So we could say that uh, characters, that the a complex mental life of the characters portrayed is a characteristic trait of literary fiction as a genre. We would not find such complexity for example, in a non-fictional essay, say a philosophical or historical essay, or even in a simple biography. Now, we know that genres manifest themselves in the mind of the reader 
as sets of expectations. When a reader uh, knows, when a reader comes to know that a text belongs to a certain genre, they form some expectation about uh, the features that this text is going to have. These expectations serve a specific cognitive role in the context of what is called the material appropriate processing framework, which is explained by this quote of Rolf Zwan that I included here, who says that knowledge of a discourse genre may function as a pragmatic device triggering in the reader comprehension strategies that are specific to that genre. So readers that come to know that a text belongs, say, to the genre of literary fiction, expect the text to present them with this comple complexity of mental states portrayed. In turn, we can hypothesize that uh, they will activate their theory of mind in order to face this complexity, to answer to the challenges that the genre is going to present them with, with the appropriate uh, cognitive tool. So, to recapitulate, we're going to read this, which is the first hypothesis that we wanted to test in our study, namely that genre expectations, specifically regarding literary fiction, can prompt theory of mind in readers and make them more attentive to characters' emotions, intentions, and beliefs. Second hypothesis, hypothesis is that this effect is mediate, mediated by readers' familiarity with fiction. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, in order to form some expectation, one must be familiar with the genre. And also, since we found, uh, we discovered, not, not, not us, <laughs> but uh, we came across a paper where uh, a group of researchers found out that uh, in movies, the more an audience could uh, uh, mentalize about uh, uh, the character's uh, mental state, the more the movie was appreciated by the audience. We hypothesize in turn that uh, by prompting a theory of mind response in readers, genre expectation influence aesthetic appreciation. Now, um, since uh, the first hypothesis revealed uh, itself to be incorrect, uh, we are not going to discuss the the other two that are both predicated upon the first one. We are going to limit our discussion to this first hypothesis. So, experimental design. Very simple, straightforward, uh, between subject design. We have two groups, they both read the same text, but in the first condition the text is presented as a novel, so literary fiction, in the second condition, the text is presented as a biography, so a non-fictional uh, text. After the reading phase, we administer several uh, questionnaires. First, a uh, questionnaire aimed at measuring the level of theory of mind deployed by participants during the reading phase. The Read and Demand in the Eyes test, which is a standard um, test for measuring theory of mind, it has a more general scope and it's based on um, a recognition of emotions from uh, photographs of facial expressions. We, need, we needed this test as a sort of baseline uh, to which to compare the results of our questionnaire and then the aesthetic appreciation questionnaire and an assessment of familiarity with fiction. The text. The text that we choose is Krista Wolf's Patterns of Childhood, of course, in its Italian version, Tramene di Infanzia, since uh, um, all the participants were our experiment were Italians. The characteristics of the text that make it uh, fit to our study are several, well, actually three. <laughs> first, uh, first of all, it's an autobiography. So it occupies an ambiguous state state uh, between fictionality and factuality. And this uh, ambiguity is actually one of the characteristic topics discussed by Krista Wolves that talks about her childhood and uh, always shifting between uh, uh, novel and uh, 
factual account. Also, the, the book, and in particular the 10th ten, chapter, has already been analyzed by Lisa Sunshine in uh, one of her most recent publications called uh, How Memories Become Literature. So we already had like an account of the passages where we had uh, this, the possibility for this deep uh, mentalizing for readers. So we decided to go with this text and, um, ah, and all these passages are all centered about the theme of deception. That is one of the most uh, ancient tools, let's say, used by literature to uh, present uh, complex uh, mental uh, states and mental landscapes. Because, you know, you have one character that want another character to think that they don't know that uh, they are deceiving them. So it's very a very complicated predicament in the, from um, theory of mind perspective. And the 10th chapter of Krista Wolf's Patterns of Childhood is all centered on this theme. So we decided to go with this text. We extracted from the 10th chapter um, text of uh, uh, 1739 words for an estimated reading time of around 8 minutes and presented it to the participants. Now, for measuring their level of theory of mind, we needed um, a test capable of capturing different levels, uh, the different levels of theory of mind deployed during the reading act. So not a gen general measure like the reading mind the ice test, but a more fine-grained specific task. This is why we decided to base our questionnaire on this uh, measure by developed by Doddle Feather and colleagues, which is called the short story task, where participants are asked to read a short story, namely the, the End of Something by Ernest Hemingway, and to answer a bunch of questions about uh, character mental states. The answers to these questions are scored zero if the participant does not mention any mental state, one if they mention one mental state, and two if they mention two or more mental states. Interesting features of this uh, um, test is that it, it is thought for neurotypical adults that usually score the highest um, scores possible in all other tests, so uh, giving origins to very skewed distribution to a ceiling effect, something that do not happen here. Uh, the results of this test and also of our questionnaire tend to have a normal distribution. It covers different dimensions of theory of mind, so accounts for attribution of beliefs, emotions, intents and desires, all of which can be found actually in a literary text, and it's based on a textual stimulus. This is very important for us. So it measures theory of mind during the reading of a text. So we took this framework and we adapted it to our te text. So we basically just changed the questions uh, in order to make, it, make them fit our text and the passages where we knew that there was a, a complex mental uh, life of the characters going on. So let's see some stats about uh, our questionnaire. First of all, uh, moderate reliability of our scoring system, an intra-class correlation coefficient of 0.52. Uh, moderate and not, not good or optimal, just because it's very... Th th there's an essential ambiguity about what constitutes the mentioning of a mental state, recognizing where the participant is mentioning a mental state. It, it's a very ambiguous concept, so it's uh, normal that uh, when you have a high number of evaluators, we had four, sometimes they will not agree, but moderate is not that bad, actually. We had a good internal consistency for the theory of mind answers, Cronbeck's uh, alpha of 0.85, which is very good. And also results of this test correlate 
with our MAT scores. Our MAT is really the ICE test. Now, some could uh, uh, see this point to correlation and think that it is not uh, that big a deal. Well, actually, it is. It's not a small correlation. If you, if you consider that uh, almost all the uh, theory of mind tests for adults, for neurotypical adults, uh, tend to have results that do not correlate at all. Or if they do, they correlate with this uh, uh, ridiculously low coefficient, like uh, you see 0 0.02, 0 0.05, 0 0.1. So a correlation of 0 0.2 is not that bad in this context. Results. Let's talk about the results of our study. This very depressing results. No, uh, we actually did not find any difference in the level of mentalizing deployed by participants who thought they were reading a fictional account, a fictional novel, and participants who thought they were reading a factual biographical account. As you can see, the means of the two groups are basically the same. We had one of the highest p-value in the history of p-value, 0.9. Uh, so no, different, no difference whatsoever. Our hypothesis was incorrect. What can be interesting is how to interpret these results. So two explanations come to mind. First of all, the first one is that... Uh, um, the complexity uh, the theory of mind is not characteristic of literary fiction, at least at the level of reader, reader's expectations. So maybe uh, this complex mentalizing is not that uh, essential a component of literary fiction. Now this is not a very probable explanation since it has been actually demonstrated that reading fiction can improve theory of mind. And uh, it is also very intuitive, and uh, Lisa Sunshine demonstrated quite extensively that uh, literary fiction actually uh, is grounded on this complex mentalizing. So what could be a better fitting interpretation is that theory of mind is not something that we can, that can be, sorry, turned off and on, or activated more or less, as we hypothesized. So one thing, one way of thinking about this could be um, by comparing theory of mind to empathy. We all know that uh, uh, there is uh, something that's called trait empathy, so empathy as a static uh, characteristic of individuals, um, and uh, something like a state empathy, so the empathy actually deployed in specific context. And we know that there are some situational factors that can influence state empathy, that can lead um, individuals to activate their empathy to a higher or a lesser degree. Now it could be the case that theory of mind does not have a state theory of mind, that there is the situational factors like the one upon which we based our study uh, do not influence theory of mind that much. It is just a static uh, function of our brain that we use to make sense of the world and that, as we've seen in the beginning, functions automatically. We cannot alter, we cannot consciously um, activate it more or less and we cannot even unconsciously activate it more or less simply because there is no such thing as a state theory of mind. Now, of course, this is a tentative interpretation. It's not clear uh, why is that, that we did not find any difference, and one should always consider problems of our experimental design. First of all, as you can see from the very high confidence intervals, that we have very wide confidence interval intervals, we had a low, stati low statistical power, which uh, um, gives us a high probability of type 2 errors. So maybe if there actually was an effect, 
we simply were not able to detect it. This is a possibility. And also, our manipulation was very small in relation to the stimulus. So the text was uh, around three pages long, and the paragraph introducing it as fiction for one condition and as a um, biography for the other was around five or six lines. Granted, we insisted a lot on the idea of fictionality on one hand and of factuality on the other, but still it could be possible since the book itself is a novel, so it contains a lot of textual cues that point in the direction of fictionality, could be possible that all this uh, uh, textual information kind of drowned out the paratext where the text was presented in a certain way. So this is all for my presentation. Thank you for the attention and uh, we'll meet uh, in Monopoly. Bye.